Welcome to the Dark Goddess where we celebrate the women who dared to live differently. This extraordinary woman was born Grace Parsons, but such a name would never work on vaudeville, despite her talent. So she adopted a more exotic name, Grace LaRue, and with that name she became part of the Zigfield Follies, a singing star in the 1920s, a musical comedy headliner on Broadway. She is reputed to be the first woman to earn over $40,000 a week in adjusted dollars in 1907. She made millions. Ironically, in retirement, she filed for bankruptcy with only $600 to her name. Her story is one of hard work, fame, and misfortune. The irony of her life is that she never realized the cultural shifting good she had done. This is her extraordinary story. Born on April 23rd, 1882 in the poverty of a Missouri farm not far from Kansas City. But poverty would not stand in her way she knew how to sing and got the best training she could get. Grace began her stage career at the age of nine in the Shakespearean repertory. Her first Broadway engagement was in The Tourist with famed Julia Sanderson and Lillian Lorraine in 1906. Then, the following year, she was featured in the Zigfield Follies of 1907 and 1908. Her accent was rapid and highly successful. Grace LaRue recalled, quote, when I was 11 years old as a child soprano singing the Psalms at the Grand Avenue Church, Kansas City, and I made my theatrical debut one year later in the same city as a page for Julia Marlowe's production of As You Like It. My initial traveling engagement came the following year when the Milton Noble Stock Company signed me up to play boy parts. But at last, before two weeks had passed, I experienced a teary attack of homesickness and I was promptly set home to mother and there I stayed very willingly until the call for the stock company in Pittsburgh. From playing boy and girl parts with this organization I went to Denver for a dramatic stock season and I retired from the stage forever seriously committed to the study of music but in 10 months i was on vaudeville end of quote vaudeville is a live variety entertainment show popular chiefly in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century featuring a mixture of specialty acts such as comedy song and dance the early 1900s was a time before television, broadcast radio, and even motion pictures. Going out was pretty much confined to shopping, church, public meetings, and vaudeville. Is it any wonder that vaudeville was so popular? Preachers felt the competition and often railed against it. Vaudeville, however, was generally family friendly and uh, perhaps had some risque humor as you might expect let's say in a 
PG-13 movie today. Promoters, after all, wanted maximum attendance for, you guessed it, maximum profits. And there was another form of vaudeville called burlesque, which could be more R-rated form of variety show, often found in cabarets, clubs, and as well as, well, theaters. It might feature broady comedy, spicy music, and female striptease. Grace LaRue was ideally suited for vaudeville. She could sing, dance, act, and even develop an acrobatic dance act. Her singing voice was considered one of the best in the world. Racial bigotry was huge at that time. Blacks had nearly no place in vaudeville, especially in white areas. These were the black-faced minstrel days, that is, white people with blackened faces as black people. Some vaudeville performers refused to appear on the same stage with actual African Americans. It is therefore most significant that Grace LaRue began her vaudeville career performing with a black comedy team known as the Inky Boys. Oddly, for her and them, it worked. In fact, audiences loved it. A beautiful and talented white girl performing with an American African comedy team filled the seats. Grace LaRue is to be commended for her step outside of the box of convention and thus helping opening the door for other black acts to perform before white audiences. There was at this time an Irish vaudeville team known as the Burke Brothers and they fashioned an act with a talking donkey named Mike. And they would ask their funny little donkey questions and it would respond with hilarious comebacks. It was highly successful. In 1898, the Burke brothers were cast in the Knickerblocker Burlesquers along with LaRue. This may have been their very first experience together. While this burlesque show included a, quote, burlesque contingent comprised of the fairest specimens that ever stepped out the old stage doors, end quote, LaRue didn't appear as one of those showgirls, rather as a comedic actor where she could showcase her song and dance. LaRue was teamed up with them. The Burke brothers had become known as, quote, the premieres of all comedians, end quote, writing, producing, and starring in their own productions. At first, LaRue had supporting roles in their shows, but soon became a headliner, and especially when she performed with her Inky Boys. Grace LaRue and Charles H. Burke became close. <laughs> Some false reports claim that they were married. However, they may have been romantically linked. She referred to him as another optimistic soul like myself, end quote. To capitalize on their comedic chemistry, Charles broke for a while from the Burke brothers and the Talking Mike gag, and in 1903 formed a vaudeville act with LaRue and the Inky Boys. This was a great success. The Hartford Courant reported, quote, Charles Burke is funnier than ever and has made a hit with Grace LaRue and the Inky Boys, end quote. The Evening Journal out of Wilmington, Delaware wrote, quote, Burke, LaRue, and the Inky Boys introduced a line of comedy that is refined and wholesome and so conspicuously good that everyone enjoys it, end quote. Wow. Unfortunately, the press referred to the Inky Boys, uh, because they were black, as Pickanannies, 
which was the dominant racial slur and character of black children, get this, for most of America's history. Despite the demeaning racial attitudes and stereotyping, LaRue continued to perform with them and to surprisingly great box office. The songs LaRue sang with them were referred to as coon songs. Later, Florence Ziegfeld was to promote black talent as well, especially Bert Williams. Despite the social norms of the time, and by the way, both Ziegfeld and LaRue found great financial success in doing so. They stayed together until LaRue got the call from Ziegfeld to join the Follies in 1907. LaRue left the group, but Charles and the Inky Boys continued as just Burke and the Inky Boys. But after 1908, little mention is made of either in Bonville. The act apparently didn't seem to work as well without her. Grace LaRue recalls, I stayed in vaudeville until I became a headliner. Then I left it for a prima donna role in the Follies, end quote. Now, a prima donna means a leading female singer. Ziegfeld paid her well for her singing voice. She is reputed to be the first woman to earn over $40,000 a week in adjusted dollars in 1907. For the 1907 Follies, she played Pocahontas, and of course, she sang. Her beautiful voice was the very thing Ziegfeld had hired her for. She continued in the Follies through 1908 and may very well have continued, but she fell in love with Brian Chandler, the millionaire kid. Brian Chandler, the millionaire kid, was the son of a former governor of the state of Vermont. It was a wealthy family. His father was also the head of the largest bank in New Hampshire. Besides all this, the family was very religious. They attended church every Sunday. They were devout Puritans. But Brian didn't seem to connect with the family religion. He later spoke of the money he received as an allowance growing up as being subversive. Quote, I had an allowance of hundreds of dollars where other boys received only nickels and quarters. When he inherited a million dollars when his father passed on, he became popularly known as the Millionaire Kid. A nickname that came about earlier when he was exactly that, a kid. He first came to the public attention when he became the first person in Boston to buy a car. He spent tons of money on his friends and loved to put on huge, lavish parties flowing with the best champagne. He said Broadway had won over the governor's son. He was a sucker. He passed out his money to his friends like it was going out of style. LaRue and Chandler first met in Chicago while she was performing Nearly a Hero, in which LaRue was the leading lady. It was an instant attraction. They were everywhere together. The press was always near. In 1908, the now famous girl from the Follies was seen registering at the Auditorium Hotel in Chicago with Chandler. The clerk at the desk, attempting to protect them, said that they had been married. In those days, of course, sleeping in the same room was something you did after marriage. Therefore, people did a lot of sneaking around, as you might imagine. When the press asked the couple if they were married, they responded no, but they never said anything about being together in a room. LaRue seemed to like complicated men. Chandler had an army of adoring stage beauties that he spent money on. 
He had been married to Grace Stitcher in 1902 when he was 22. Stitcher sued for divorce, citing his fondness for drink and other women. Additionally, Mrs. Edith Roberts of Massachusetts alleged his attention to his daughter had resulted in $20,000 damages to the young woman. Stitcher settled quietly through the secret divorce system in New York that the rich took advantage of. And then there was the $10,000, that would be $245,000 today, suit from actress Miss Joan Schwartz for breach of contract. Ultimately, Chandler would be married and divorced four times and sued for alleged breach of contract twice and would take his own life by suicide in 1942. He was complicated. Despite all the obstacles, red flags, LaRue married him anyway. Their 1909 marriage happened in London. Naturally, they honeymooned in London and Paris. Nothing was too good for her. He burned through money while in Europe on every possible extravagance. But why marry in London? Because the former Miss Chandler's divorce decree forbid Chandler from marrying during her lifetime. So they couldn't do it in the US, they did it in the UK. While in Europe, LaRue appeared in many venues, bolstering her renown. She became so famous, in fact, that when she reported to Scotland Yards that her jewelry and money valued at $7,000, that would be $178,492 today, had been stolen from her hotel room while she was performing at the Palace Theatre in London, it made worldwide news. Byron Chandler became her financial backer for plays they now produced together. But despite the money backing, not all shows were successful. The St. Louis Dispatch reported that the Chandler-backed Betsy bores its Garrick audience. Grace LaRue has an unsatisfying play, end of quote. And the lifestyle of wine, women, and song for the millionaire kid had kicked in again. The so-called ideal husband and wife team of money and talent was beginning to crumble. LaRue could be tough. LaRue filed for divorce in 1914 alleging Chandler was unfaithful and that he beat her. He denied ever being violent and said she would not get anything from him. Quote, I guess Grace is out for the coin, he said. She has plenty of money and good theatrical engagements besides. She says I threatened to shoot her. That is simply ridiculous. Why, I have always loved, honored, and respected her, end of quote. He even tried to weasel out of responsibility to LaRue by claiming, quote, that he was not legally separated from his first wife at the time. He considered his marriage to her invalid, end of quote. The claim didn't fly. A few months later, in May of 1914, Chandler announced his intention to marry a much younger Hilma A. Nilsson. Crazy as it may seem, Grace reconciled with the millionaire kid two years later in 1917, settling their marital differences. This came after he inherited another million from his grandmother and had made a killing on Wall Street. Apparently, a private financial deal was struck, and all was good between them. Despite everything, LaRue continued strong in her career. 
modeling clothes was now a part of her shows. Women came to her shows not just to be entertained, but also to see the latest fashions La Rue wore. They were not disappointed. Some of her clothes came from Paris, some from New York, and some she made herself. Quote, at the International Fashion Show at New York, LaRue was considered to be the best dressed woman in the world, end of quote. About her performances with high fashion, she said that each dress she created was to serve an expression of the song she was rendering. So, she even had a philosophy for it. Whether it was Charles Burke, Florence Ziegfeld, or the millionaire kid, it seems LaRue needed to have a powerful and influential man in her life. Perhaps she was never fully aware of her own power. After all, these strong, influential men also were drawn to her. She was, in her own right, a powerful and influential woman. There was no man that she ever fought so hard for than the popular actor Hale Hamilton. She fought off all foes, married him, and was with him until the day he died. It all began in 1918 when she began dating Hamilton. By 1919 she was appearing in productions with him, even though he had been married before. LaRue married Hamilton in 1920. Hamilton had been married to actress Myrtle Tannehill for six years. They had divorced two years previously in 1918. But then, in 1920, Hamilton's ex-wife dropped a surprisingly unexpected lawsuit on Grace LaRue for $100,000 charging him with alienation of affection. That would be roughly $2 million in today's money. His ex claimed that her ex had first met LaRue in 1908 and, quote, by giving him money and following him about the country weaned him away from her, end of quote. She also falsely claimed that LaRue was still married to the Million Dollar Kid. To complicate things further, another showgirl, Luella Gear, claimed to have been the wife of the Millionaire Kid. Ah, the only thing that was running smoothly during this time was LaRue and Hamilton's production of Dear Me. It was a huge success. How this whole mess was finally resolved isn't entirely clear due to the secret legal settlements of that time. And life went on with LaRue slowly fading from public memory. Every once in a while, there was a news item about LaRue. She claimed that color could talk. She developed a corset for slender and middleweight women. And it was reported that the Prince of Wales liked Grace LaRue's golden voice so much that he requested an encore of her song, What'll I Do? Two times. Between October 1922 and 1923, she played successfully at the Music Box in New York in Irving Berlin's second Music Box Review. She was back in London again at the Coliseum in the summer of 1924 in a sketch, Dangerous Advice, with her husband, Hale Hamilton. Returning to America, the fading LaRue appeared in productions such as The Greenwich Village Follies at the Winter Gardens in New York in 1928, where she was limited to two songs. By the early 1930s, she was living in retirement in California, where she made a brief appearance 
in Mae West's film She Done Him Wrong in 1933. In her second and final screen appearance, she played herself in Bing Crosby's If I Had My Way in 1940 as a salute to old vaudeville. The truth was that the day of live stage performances had given way to motion picture theaters. Even though variety shows will always be with us, vaudeville had seen its better days. Even though she managed to get a couple of bit parts in motion pictures, she was never again the headliner she had been. Her large amounts of money had ended. In 1937, she and her husband filed voluntary bankruptcy in federal court, listing assets of only $600 and insurmountable liabilities of $21,210. Finally, in 1954, the Ziegfeld singing star of the 1920s, Grace LaRue Hamilton, passed away at age 75, shortly after the death of her beloved husband, Hale Hamilton. In her final days, she had written an autobiography that has never been published and is now probably lost. It was named after her biggest successful show, Dear Me. The show Dear Me was about writing yourself a letter. The thoughtful premise was, quote, When you have been downhearted, discouraged, or rebellious, have you ever tried writing yourself a letter and offering yourself a remedy? No, try it at once and see how quickly your viewpoint of life will change, end quote. We will never know what Grace LaRue wrote in her Dear Me autobiography, but she was probably unaware of her great contribution to the American stage. That is, in an era of extreme bigotry against black, she mounted a successful career by teaming up with two talented black performers and entertaining white audiences. She was one of the daring performers who helped introduce black artists and culture to a larger audience. Like Gray LaRue, often the good things we do go unnoticed, even by ourselves. Take a moment and write that Dear Me letter to yourself, and you may be surprised as you discover the real you, the good you. This has been The Dark Goddess, where we feature women who push the edge and lived differently.